turn your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 28 as we'll conclude this uh, this series. So while you're doing that, let me open a word of prayer. Father, my prayer is that you would give us a heart like yours, that we would be the light in this darkness and the truth in this, all this chaos that's happening in, the, in our world today. Father, help us to lead others who want to learn and want to grow in their faith. And give us to follow, uh, follow the courage to disciple others as we've been discipled. So, Father, I pray as I conclude this, that once again, Father God, that it would not be my what to hear or, or I say, but it's all from you and from your word that to hear and do. Because, Father, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and we need you. We need you more than we've ever needed anyone in our lives. So we ask this in your name. Amen. So we are concluding this series, and, and it actually, um, how God laid us on my heart will lead us into the next one because what we're talking about today will definitely will need us help more of, of next week. But I just want to start with a little bit of a, a humor story, if you will. There was this 911 call that came out, and the operator answered, and the voice in the other end was weeping. It was, he was crying. He goes, Bubba is dead. Oh, Bubba is dead. And, and, and we, were, we, we were out hunting, and, and he, he grabbed his heart, and he kneeled over, and he, he, he's, he's dead. 911 operator says, okay, okay, I, I need you to remain calm. Yeah, I need you to remain calm, but first we need to confirm that he is dead. The line goes silent for a moment. And the 911 operator hears a little scuffling, a little noise in the background. Then they hear, then they hear this big, loud shotgun go off. And the guy gets back on the phone and says, okay, now what? Get it? Okay, if I got to explain it, it wasn't funny. But the point is, is that this is the point we're trying to get at, at this. And I, I know this is not a true story, right? But it was more of a humorous thing. But the point is, is, is clarity. Right? Especially when it regards to an important assignment that's very crucial. In today's text, there cannot be no more clarity and no more crucial than we can get with this. And we want to make sure that we totally not we only we understand it, we get it, we do it. But before we get into this, God laid this on my heart, and I think it's 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 relevant for all of us. There's some questions that we need to answer as a church and as individuals. And these are the questions. Who are we as a church? Who are we as a church? Second question. Where are we going? Where are we going? Thirdly. What are we called to do? What are we called to do? These are three questions that we, all of us, it's not here, churches all around, but especially we're going to talk about us here today. What are questions that we have to answer? So let me give you a, a quick recap of what we've, this series has, has happened. We already know the word for disciple is a learner who follows a master teacher, right? And, and, it's, and, and now you have to understand, in, in our culture today, because it's very crucial here learning when if you were living in those days back when Jesus days learning in, the, in his days time was very uh, uh, relational and really, uh, really holistic we're, we're not like that today things aren't relational they're not holistic so we need to understand that when we hear the word disciple when we hear the word discipleship it, mean, it meant much more than just the transfer of information then because when we hear that word today, that's all we think about is that, okay, I'm being the same, I'm, he's teaching someone, you're reading, you're being, the information is being transferred to, from the word into your lives. So, but back then it was much more than that. Because as I said, it refers to imitating the teacher's life. It, it means training in his values, reproducing his teachings. 
Christian discipleship implies a relationship with a master teacher. That means following them and adhering to their way of life. I'm not the teacher. Christ is the teacher. So we need to follow him. We need to adhere to his, his way of life. So after we receive the invitation to follow Jesus, what we sometimes forget, or we, I would say forget would probably be the best word, is that we are entering into a lifelong journey and a relationship with him, which is where we are learning, which is where we're growing, which is where we fail, because we're not always perfect, we're not always getting right, but when we fail, what we do, we have to obviously repent, but we need to go back to learning. We need to go back to growing again, right? But it's not only failing, we, we learn through everything in this word about forgiving and, and loving others as he has taught us to love. And, and I know that this can really be an, an, an incredible, difficult process at times. I, I get it. But make no mistake, it's all worth it. It's all worth it knowing that one day, if you're a follower of Christ, you're going to spend eternity with our Savior. Where there is no more crying, no more hurt, no more pain, nothing. But we've got to go through the process. We've got to go through the journey. And one of the greatest responsibilities that we have, and the, one of the Privileges, if you will, because I think it's a privilege of following Jesus is sharing him with others. A command. Jesus tells his disciples. Matthew 5, starting verse 13. I'm going to read it, but I'm not going to talk about all of it. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its salt be restored? It is no longer good for anything except be thrown out and trampled on other people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all that is in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This verse is really, the, this verse I'm going to back up on is this is the key to this thing right here. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. You're out of power. You, what do you do? You find a flashlight. You find whatever it is. And let's say you have no, you're in complete darkness. And you take that and put a hat over top of it. That's really what this is saying. We wouldn't do that. We need to see, right? We, we want the light to be seen. That's what he's saying here. You don't light it. You don't come to a follower of Christ and then you hide it. You, you don't put it under a blanket. You don't put it away. You put it on a stand, right? When you have a candle and it's, the lights are out, what do you do? You put it on a stand so that way, or you're carrying it around with you so that you can see where you're going. But it also gives light to everyone in that house. Just not for you. The light that you shine through that candle, through the flashlight, helps Others see the light. This is what Jesus is telling us to do. Others must see it. The light of Christ and the warmth of the gospel were meant for everyone. And these verses make it very clear that we are not private followers of Christ. Our faith must be public. There is no secret agents in the church. Right? We are to be the light, and the light has only one job to do, and that is to shine. Now, but we're also to be the salt. And that's just as important as being the light. Because we're commanded to share Christ with all that we can. And it will sting. Because people in darkness don't like the light. People have a cut on their hand. You, the one thing you don't want to put in it is salt. Try to eat a crab after you cut your finger, and that salt gets in that cut. It stinks. 
God's word will be offensive to those who don't want to hear it. Doesn't mean we don't share it. Well, we need to share the love of God. What better way of showing the love of God than sharing the gospel? Well, it may hurt them. Good. They need to hear it. See, we're commanded to share Christ. Keep that and that all that we can. So our main passage today, we all heard it, called the Great Commission. So I'm going to go ahead and read those three verses, four verses, 18, 19, 20. I'm going to read these, and then we're going to spend some time with them. Starting at verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth hath been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So let me spend some time on this, right? If this is not a point, I just want to put it up there. Um, just the Great Commission is not one of the points. We'll get to those in a minute. But let's talk about this Great Commission. Look, like I said at the beginning with the 9 1, the, the, the humor joke, right? This is the final instruction given to, by Jesus Christ to his disciples as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the same thing for us as well. It's the last thing. Right? Let, me, let me think of that. Now I'm going to try to put this in other words. When a loved one or someone that you really care about is dying, they're on their deathbed, and you, get, you, were, and you were able to go visit them and before they, they gave their last final breath and they spoke to you, what do we normally try to do? We try to listen carefully to what they're saying. It may, maybe for some importance, maybe some last, whatever it may be, some wisdom, so whatever it may be, that you could take that with you until it's your time to pass. Well, this is what Jesus is saying. Look, if you're going to listen to anything else, any of us I say, let's get a hold of this. This one last statement I'm giving you here from Matthew is so important that I want you to follow it. I want you to hear it with clarity. It is a directive, if you will, that, that serves as a roadmap for every believer's journey. You see, this Great Commission is not a suggestion. He said, well, if you feel like it, he's not saying that at all. It's not an optional task. Well, you, you might want to do that. No, it's none of that stuff at all. It is a divine mandate. A, a sacred duty that every follow Christ is expected to carry out. It is our marching orders. Tim Keller said this. Discipleship is not an option. Jesus says that if anyone would come after me, he must follow me. And following Jesus includes humble submission to his authority and teaching. You see, when Christ says, at the beginning of it there, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, it means that he's got lordship over all. Right, right, he's now in charge. He, it's, everything has been handed to Christ, and, and we're reminded that the mission that we're called to, to undertake is not based on human authority, it's not based on, on, on our wisdom, but on the divine authority of Christ. Jesus saying, I am in charge. In essence, the time of, of, of his humiliation, dying on the cross, is coming to an end. And now, God has exalted him above all. And it's this, this authority here that empowered us to go forth and make disciples of all nations. How? By giving us the Holy Spirit. So if Christ is given the green light, who can hold us back? Only you can hold yourself back. Because God has given you the green light to go. Making disciples is the heart of the Great Commission. This is why when Jesus said in verse 19, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. And we'll get to that in a second. But in the English, right, there are several verbs in our text. Now, I wasn't much on uh, an English class. I just did, did just enough to get by. But I've learned over the years through God's word that these words mean something. But in the English, the go, go, make disciples, baptize, teach, they're all verbs. But in the Greek, there is only one, make disciples. 
All the other words that are translated as verbs are actually to modify the verb. The verb is the essential thing. The other things are, are extensions of, of applications of it. So, so think about this. Make disciples is if that's a thing, then what are the other words? There's a book called out, maybe some of you read it, called The Massive Plan of Evangelism. But in this book, the author says this. The Great Commission is not merely a go to the ends of the earth preaching the gospel, nor to baptize a lot of converts, nor to teach them to preach the precepts of Christ, but to make disciples. To build men like themselves who were constrained by the commission of Christ, that not all, that they not only follow Jesus themselves, but as them, this is the key, led others to follow him too. It goes on and says, the criteria upon which any church should measure its success is not how many new names are added to the role or how much the budget is increased, but rather how many Christians are actively winning souls and training them to win the multitudes. Unfortunately, churches today judge their success by how many ten or how many baptisms they can count. But you know what? Heaven does not celebrate any of those numbers. It only celebrates disciples. How many have started a relationship with Christ? How many are going in the kingdom of God? You know how I know this? Look at the thief on the cross. What do you say to Jesus? Remember me when you get to your kingdom. He never went to Sunday school. He never attended the church. He never got baptized. Do you think, say, well, I guess he should, he should live. I, maybe I won't have him. Maybe God says, man, I want him, I want, I want him dying because I want him to, I want him to go, get, go to attend a church and be baptized. That way I know that he's good. God doesn't care about that. He wants it because it's a command. But if you're on a dying breath and you know the Lord and you receive the Lord that night, guess what? And you die, you're going to heaven just like this thief. But Jesus said, I will remember you. So the first thing that we need to answer is what does it mean to make disciples? Because it's more than just, just converting people to Christianity. It involves nurturing them in their faith, helping them grow spiritually, and equipping them to live out their faith in their daily lives. That's what it's about. It's about re reproducing followers of Christ who are, are committed to living according to his teachings and commands. And there's plenty of scriptures. I'm not going to turn to them, but I'm going to, I'm going to say them. In Titus 2, Paul commands older women to train the younger women. Right? Paul just tra tells them, you've got to go do this. Train them. Right? But that's not it. Second Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to, to train faithful men in his congregation so they can train others also. Right? But in Ephesians 6, Paul tells fathers to train the children in the ways of God. So this command is not just for a few. It is all who say they are our follower of Christ. Which means, church, none of us are excluded from this. We are all to do this. It is a command of the Lord. And the Bible says, for those who never do right, don't do it, is a sin. So if you're not doing it, you're sinning against God. So we think of all the bad things we do that we're sinning against God, but we, we forget that we're not doing the things he's told us to do. And we're judged to that. Oh, you may not lose your salvation. Well, what's going to happen? Well, you have to meet him face to face. Hey, how can we even talk to soon? So and so, I set it up right for you. All you had to do was just share. Hey, how come that? I don't know that's how it's going to be a process, but that's what I'm thinking in my head. All the missed opportunities we had to share the gospel. And this process of discipleship is a lifelong journey. And here's the thing. It requires patience, doesn't it? It requires patience. It requires dedication. It requires a deep love for God and, capital A-N-D, and for others. It is a full body, mind, and soul experience. It's everything. 
So that's the price of the discipleship, right? But he doesn't go in there. What does he also say? He says, baptize in the name of the Father, right? Some of that. Baptism is another crucial aspect of the Great Commission, and it follows the command to go and to make, right? Go and make. But this baptism is identified with Jesus Christ. It's an outward picture of an inward reality. That's what baptism is, right? It, it, it is telling the world that you've now put your old life behind, because you're not just talking to privately, you're telling the world, well, one of the reasons why when we baptize, I like to go out to the sandy point. I like to go do that out there where we get baptized in the water, which everybody can see. Because you're making a declaration that you are done, you're the old self, you're now going to follow Christ. Because you are a new creation, and you are going to live for him. And hopefully you're going to fully follow him. And you have to understand in these days of Jesus, this is a big deal for Jews because it meant turning their back on Judaism to follow Jesus. To us, it means hardly anything. It should mean everything, but to them it did. It meant them everything. They risked being rejected by their family, being kicked out of the synagogue, being ostracized by their family, their friends, their community, all this. They could have lost everything. To follow him. Isn't that what Jesus says? It will cost you. Baptism is your testimony that you've died with Christ in his death. Pictured. And that's pictured by going down under the water. Burial. And then what? You're raised to new life when you come out of that water. Just remember. Baptism does not save or even cleanse you. It's an outward symbol of the inward reality of salvation that was immediately yours, salvation, when you believed. I always tell people the wedding ring. The wedding ring doesn't save you. It's just an outward saying that you're taken. Baptism is the same thing. Doesn't save you. Doesn't, doesn't save you. Because you started to see before that. A pastor of mine once said, if you got baptized, you weren't saved, you were just a wet sinner. It's just showing the world you now have a new master. It ain't the devil, it ain't the world, it's Christ. Finally, there's one more command in here. Verse 20 says, teaching him to observe all that command of you. Third part of the right is very important. I believe the church has failed this too. Jesus is told the 12 disciples and the church that when we've made disciples and we baptize them, that then these new disciples need to be treated like disciples. Remember, the word disciple literally means a learner. So we need to take these new disciples and teach them about Jesus and all that he commanded. That word observe that you read here in, this, in, in the text means to obey or to keep. A disciple of Jesus needs to learn about Jesus and imitate Jesus and does this by being in God's word. It does this by reading it. It does this about studying it. It does this by learning the Christian life and putting that into practice. So we are to come alongside and teach them how to do this. So our teaching should not just be about communicating knowledge, but about inspiring and, 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 and obedience and transformation. It's about helping people understand the teachings of Christ and empower them to apply these teachings in their day-to-day -day lives. And, and I think this is another thing that church churches fail at is because we we treat sharing the gospel as a checkoff box so let's say that you share the gospel and the holy spirit comes into this person's life and now they're saved what are you doing with them one of the reasons why i i, I get up here and i at the end i, I tell people i want them you know, if you got saved let me let, let pastor Darrell and i know we yes first and foremost we want to 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 praise the Lord for what he's done in your life. But what do I end with? It says because, but we want them to connect because the road's not going to get easy. The only difference is you have Christ, and Christ can help you through this. But we want to help along that process. We want to come alongside of you. So if you share the gospel and they get saved, what are you doing with those people? Well, come to church. No. Let's talk. Let's have, before we go there, let's have some one-on-one -on -one time. And I think what happens is people get scared. 
You and so you may be here today. You say, "Well, yeah, I have no problem sharing the faith." Okay, what about discipling them? And some of you may be doing that, and that's awesome. But I, I but I would I would beg to, to think that there's probably some of you who I don't mind sharing my faith, but I really think I say I don't know what to do with them. I don't I don't, I don't know enough to disciple them. Yes, you do. You just don't know it. He goes on, this promise is Christ, assures that we're not alone in our mission, right? Because what it says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christ is with us every step of the way. So as you share the gospel, Christ is with you. Why? Because you're the Holy Spirit. He's, he's, you're sharing it with Christ is there with you to help you that. But not only is he every step of the way, he's guiding you what to say. He strengthens you as you say it. And after you're done. And he empowered us to fill our calling. These are the things that he does. Let me give you an example. Most of you know when I was the Lord, a, a gentleman from my first church came and, and he, he we, that I attended, and he, we took us took me aside, quick version, took me aside, we, we ended up doing the Bible study. And about a six months of my journey, I, I told you all part of my testimony was a, a trusting, right? The BG and bill, pain and all that. I'm not going to get into that stuff. But you know that I had a really trust issue with the Lord because, because of my background. I was all about money, 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 money. So I didn't want to tithe. And, and, and so I, I shared that with the one who I was, who was discipling. And I knew what the Lord had already said. But you know, you still want that, that little confirmation more. Even though his, that word should have been enough. But young in my faith, I wasn't, you know, I wanted also to hear it. He not only said, yes, you should listen, but he throwed scripture my way to back it all up. That is what discipling does. You help come alongside that person and help them grow. And I can tell you, I can, I can share with you, I trust in that day, and I've done it times in the, from then on up until now. And I always know that, that, that God was always there. He, I know that he was always guiding my steps, strengthening me through each bump in the road. And it's helped me in my own journey. And every time, every single time it happened, when I had to overcome obstacles and, and hardships in this broken world, he was there. It wasn't always easy, but it was there. And I believe today, I really believe today, this is why I'm so passionate about discipling people. Because I know, I know what it can do to other people, how it can help them grow in their own faith. I am not the person that I feel comfortable being here in front of you all. I would rather be the person behind the scenes discipling you all one on one. But that's what I feel comfortable with. But God says, nope, you're going to do this. And I've already tried that before and back out, and it doesn't work that very well. So if God tells you to do something, you better do it, or it's going to be miserable for you. I'm, for, I'm definitely an example of that. It could be. So, how do we, how, how do we reproduce? How does it happen? First of all, we have to obey. We have to obey His command, no doubt. But we also need to do what? Make the, making disciples in a broken world. Making disciples in a broken world. Making disciples and being an active participant in the Great Commission. Look, they're not very, they're not easy task. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna sit, sit up here and share code and, and all that. For some people, it comes naturally and they don't have a problem with it, I get it. But for other people, if you're like me, it doesn't come always easy. Because we know there is real opposition out in the world. And there's a very, very real enemy who doesn't want to see any believer to come and mature and productive faith, let alone of, of producing others. Look, because in John 16, 33, Jesus explicitly tells us very quickly, I have said, said these things to you that in me, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Doesn't say you may, maybe possibly, no, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen? Now you might say, well, I don't have this peace. 
I saw crisis. I saw tribulation going on in my life. Well, let me tell you something. This peace is not just mere serenity, right? Or, or, or and the absence of crisis in your life. It doesn't mean that. The peace that Jesus is talking about is something that, that only he can give. And it's something that followers can experience in a crisis. Daughter, I'm not going to get into it, but daughter passed away. Peace. Only God can explain it. Only God. Because I couldn't. But in reality, and this is true. You and I, we can't know if we truly have peace until the conflict happens. Because if you haven't experienced it, how are you going to know about it? How, how have you experienced the peace? God give you that peace. So, but church, we need to be encouraged. We need to fight the good fight of faith, right? And, and rest and resist the temptation to give up. Because when we give up, we lose. God doesn't lose. We lose. We lose out on the peace. We lose out on what he's given us when we give up. Rob Gallaty says in the book, Growing Up, How to Be the Supper and Make Disciples. He goes, when the church becomes an end in itself, it ends. When Sunday school, as great as it is, becomes an end in itself, it ends. When small groups ministry becomes an end in itself, it ends. When the worship service becomes an end in itself, it ends. What we need is for discipleship to become the goal. And then the process never ends. The process is fluid. It is moving. It is active. It's a living thing. It must continue to go on. Every disciple must make disciples. I have been churches who are the congregation of the church. I, one of the first churches I came from, the church I came from when I did this, they were getting an older congregation. I've seen other churches who are older. I know there's one in Cadenceville that's an older church. They're getting older. They're not bringing young people in. These old people are set in their ways and they just feel they want to be comfortable in the cocoon in their church. They don't want to get out. I don't want to be that. I want to grow old together, but I want to have bring others along with us. Remember, the subject is not about conversion. It's about transformation. Because we can invite people to church, they can get saved, but if we just leave them there and don't do anything, they're going to fall off. They're going to fall off. More times than not. There's always an exception, but more times than not. So it's about transformation. It's about helping people become more like Christ in their thoughts, in their words, in their actions. And this process takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And it can be frustrating. Trust me, I know all about the frustration of what, what, not watching people grow the way God's intended. But this is why it's so important to remember that we have Jesus with us every step of the way. Because we need him. As Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. There's so much truth into that statement. See, there is no lasting reproduction without Christ and without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. So remember, and you're going to hear this several times because I want you to understand it. I want us to get a different mindset. Making disciples is not just about increasing the number of believers. That's not it. It's about producing genuine followers of Christ who are committed to living out his teachings in their daily lives. It's about helping people experience the life-changing power of the gospel. And we become agents of, of, in their communities and in the world. You know if you are saved, you know the life-changing power that God has. Because it changed you. Because I sure know it. Because look at your life before you were saved and look at it now. We are different people, or we should be. Because now we are God's children. So it's about changing the world, right? And that's point number two. Because it is about changing the world. There is no such thing as a non-producing follower. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Which means if you're really following Jesus, he's making you into that. It wasn't just for the disciples. It's for us. 
If you're really following me, I will make you fishers of men. I, you will be able to go share your faith. You'll be able to go, again, you're not saving them. You, all your job is to do, all my job is to do is to share Christ with them. Because if it's not all about reducing followers of Christ to increase the number of Christians, then what is it? It's about nurturing individuals to become true disciples who live out and teach of Jesus in their daily lives. This means that they not only believe in Christ, but they also strive to follow his example and follow his teachings. It's about creating this ripple effect, right? You, you see it when a rock is thrown into a lake, when it's clear, right? It gets a ripple effect where it starts rolling, right? It's about that, which each disciple goes on to make more disciples. Spreading the word of God and his love throughout the world. This process is how we change the world. It's one um, con conversation, it's one person, and one disciple at a time. It starts with one. As I mentioned in week one, in David's Platt's book, Making Disciples of Jesus. So making disciples of Jesus is the overflow of the delight in being disciples of Jesus. Now, if you think about this quote, this is a very challenging quote, which begs the further question, are you overflowing delight? Another example. When we, when my wife and I were saved, and, and, and my son, one of my sons got saved, we were on vacation, and we were at this pool. And that might be off on some of the story, but I know the gist of it. And, and I remember my son coming to us, and they looked across the way, and he seen, I think it was two ladies, they were sitting there. There were two ladies sitting over there, and uh, by there. <laughs> he was so excited. He said, I'm going to go tell them about Jesus. He tromped us, tromped himself all the way on the other side of there, and he talked about it. He talked to Jesus about him. They listened. He was a kid. Like a two, tell him to go away, like you do like with a dog. No, he was a kid. He, he shared it. He loved the fact that he was a Christian. He loved the fact that Jesus was in his life. So he wanted to go tell people about it. Think about that. The excitement of his faith said it all. So church, do you remember when you were excited about your faith? And do you want to tell everybody? Something happened along the way, didn't it? We stopped becoming excited about Christ. But I want to ask you a question because we always hear that we're in Christ. Have you ever stopped recently to consider the fact that you, as a follower of Christ, are in Christ? There are verses in Scripture saying this that are referring to it, but, but what does that mean? Steve Lawson said this. To be in Christ, first of all, means that we have a saving relationship with Christ and are brought into union and communion with him in such a way that as we are in Christ, what is true of Christ becomes true of us. His grace is, and his resources become our experience and, and, and possession. He goes on and says this. So the life of Christ is now in us by virtue of our being in Christ and Christ in us. He says it's a double union, if you will. My entire life is now lived for Christ. But that life that I live is lived by virtue of being in Christ. His grace, his sufficiency, and the riches of his mercy are now of value, available to us. Let me give you a, let me give you some scripture for this example. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. It goes on 28, but I'm really going to focus on these two. For in Christ, that's the key, Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Paul is speaking to the Christians in Galatia, right? And he says, remind them of their new identity since they place their faith in Christ. The word baptized doesn't mean water baptism here. Okay, once you get that, understand that. To be baptized into Christ means that they were identified with Christ, having left their old sinful lives and fully embracing a new life of Christ. So when we say that my, my entire life is now lived for Christ, but the life that I live is to live by virtue of being in Christ, his grace, efficiency, and the riches of mercy are now available to me. 
what he's saying is, is that you are a little Christ. Someone, I don't, I don't know the truth of this, but it, someone said this, and Stephen, when he was being stoned, if Jesus stopped Paul on the road to Damascus, right? What did Jesus say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is referencing to Stephen stoning. Because what? He was in Christ. Everything about him. Just being to Christ. So the question, church, do people see Christ in you? Are you beaming it out of you? But not only are we in Christ, but we're also a disciple of Christ. You, me, are part of a, of a royal priesthood, right? You were, you were called, we were called, we were gifted, we were anointed to be his ambassador to a broken and hurting world. This is truly the heart of missions. This is why missions go to other nations to carry out Jesus' commission to the church, making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them, so they can go and do the same thing. <laughs> so what is your part of the commission? Well, maybe you're not called to go to another country. But we still should be, at some of Jesus, we should still be making the saviors. We should still be baptizing them and teaching them the right where we are. And that is in our communities. That is other, among other people groups, wherever you go. That is our commission. That is our job. And I said this in the beginning. Number three. Being a son of Christ is an honor and a privilege. No one can tell me any differently. Because I don't deserve it. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve nothing from him. So anything he gives is an honor, it's a privilege. It's an invitation to do something bigger and more amazing than most any of us could ever even imagine. Disciples create disciples. That's why I believe it's my favorite part of being a father, not for my glory, but to see God work in life with someone that I obeyed that Christ commanded. But how do I get started? We're going to get more detail when the world comes to us next week. But how do I get started? Well, it's simply. You could, you could get together to get a Bible journey and two or three others join you on that journey. Work together. As simple as that. And here's the thing, the beauty of having three or four people doing the same thing together is everyone's feeding off one another. Look, even Jesus had his three. He focused his attention on Peter, James, and John. So this is a great place to start. This is our home. Now look, you may not be able to speak like others. Moses had a hard time. So guess what? Aaron came along. But you can, we all can, invite someone into our lives to observe our walk with Jesus, to show them how to follow Jesus, like you follow him. Let them see and hear how much you love Jesus, where you would be without him. And prayfully, you will see God do a work like only he can do with a person, just like he did with you and I. And it's all because we obeyed God's final words. Now I open up with some questions, right? And I want you to think about this. Who, who are we as a church? Are we just existing? Are we just going in circles? We think that. What are you going to do to help us get out of it? Not what I'm going to do, not what Pastor L's going to do. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to get us where God wants us? Second question. Where are we going? Don't like the direction that we're going in? You don't like it something? Well, what can you do to change that direction? 
Because it's not about Pastor Aaron and I only. It's about a group. Yes, we have our fair, we have our culture, we have to do what we have to do. I get that. There's nothing wrong. I'm not saying we're going to put all the, all this on you. But what are you doing? What is your part? To get where God wants us to go and what direction He wants us in. Lastly, what are we, and I make sure I put that word you, called to do? Are you a disciple maker? Are you intentionally bringing someone else along as a disciple? I can't answer that question for you because this one really is on you. If you think the first two connects to the third one, you're right. Because without this one, the first two ain't going to happen. It doesn't matter. Here's the thing I get from people. I don't know enough. It doesn't matter if you're still growing yourself or even if you're just a new baby in Christ. It does not matter. Every disciple of Jesus can be a disciple maker. Every fellow Christ is born to reproduce. And maybe you're just realizing this right now. Maybe just you're understanding that. that maybe I can, I can do this. I, I know I can do this. And you're ready to take that first step, but you don't know what you but you're, you, you're wasting so much time. Well, don't, don't get beat up over it. Start today. Because God's not going to look at your past. He's going to look at you now. But you see, this is one thing I, I, I learned, and it takes a while. If you've read the Bible through, then you already know enough. But there are people who will be eating. Well, I never knew that in the Bible. Guess what? You heard it now, now you know. So now you've held a cow before it. There may be things that you might say that, I never heard that, i never seen that. I didn't see what the Bible says. Okay, maybe you weren't held accountable. But guess what? You hear it now, you're now accountable to that. So now you have to answer. I have to answer to God. For one of the things that we're learning today. I have to answer to God for all the things you've been since you've been here at Brooklyn Park Community Church. These are things you have to answer to, to God. Not me. I have to answer for own. You have to answer for your own. But don't feel beat up about it. Start today. Jesus called every follower to follow him, to be a disciple. This begins with the fact that you must be his child. You must be born again. It starts there. And if you, have, if you don't know Christ then, then, and you're not saved, then obviously you can't be a disciple. Let's remember, when I just called to be followers of Christ, sitting on the sidelines, pusers, if you will, we're also called to make followers of Christ. We're called to participate. Actually, we're actually commissioned to participate in the greatest building project of all time, the building of his church. When Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, I tell you, Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, no matter how much Satan attacks you, how much the world is, is, is on you, as it's where the next series begins, the church, God, will always win. It may not be the way you want it, but guess what? He always wins. And guess what? Hell always loses. So don't give up. Don't stop moving forward. And I know it's a massive task. But, and it will have eternal consequences, whether you do or not. But understand that we're not in this alone. We've got each other, but most importantly, we've got Jesus. With all his authority and all of heaven along with him. We are little Christ. So my question is, what are you waiting for? Jesus sent us out. So you know what, church? Let the disciple begin. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this enormous task you've given us. We thank you that, that it's an honor and a privilege to be able to serve you. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to go share you with others. And Father God, if we're here today and we know you as our Savior, that we all have a testimony of what you've done in our lives and how you changed us and where we'd be without you. So, Father, I pray, Lord God, that we would take that as examples. And, Father God, that we would share them. And if someone here today that, that, that knows you as a Savior, but they haven't done this, they haven't started, today is a good day to start. 
They repent from their past, the things that they could have done and didn't do, the sins they committed for the, because they knew to do right, but they didn't do it. They, they, they've repented of all that. They've confessed it. And now they want to be able to serve you and go share. So, Father, I also want to pray for those who don't even know you, whether you're online or here, and you thought you knew the Lord, but you really don't know. You don't have a relationship with him. You may think you do, but let's not be those people where you said in Matthew that I never knew you. So make sure, for if, without a shadow of a doubt, you know that if you were to die, you are going to heaven. Because I don't want anyone to have this false hope. And like I said, Lord, if you want to know the Lord, it's really simple. It's simple in believing you. Just admit. Admit that you're a sinner, Lord. Believe. Believe, Father God, that, that you, that not only you died, but you were buried and you rose on that third day. As we confess our sins to you, knowing that without you, we are doomed and we are on our way to hell. And Father God, we know that you don't send us there. We send ourselves. So I pray, Father God, if anyone has done that or wants to know how to do that, Father, they would come see me or Pastor Daryl. Because we want to help you get along the way. We want to come alongside of you and disciple you to make you more like Jesus. Again, Father, we thank you and we love you for all that you do and will do. This we pray in your name.